Hello, I'm Chris Athanas. I'm a KMP developer. Tech support's coming out Tuesday to close that portal. And today we're going to be getting into uh, this video. I'm going to be reacting to it, watching through it for you at 1.5x or so. Um, uh, it's called the Future American Dream. I start. I started yelling at the screen. I was like, I might as well, might as well record you for your entertainment purposes. Let's get going. If you're an average 22 year old today and you're kind of staring into the future and you're like, am I going to be able to like get married, have a family, have kids, own a home, send my kids to a good school and then have good health care? Like, <laughs> like on the one hand, we're on a very bad track. Well, I mean, if you don't, something's terribly, terribly wrong. I mean, it's already off the rails, but like if you if, if you are, if you're 22 and you just, you don't see this like turning around soon, uh, something's very wrong. For that. On the other hand, in some ways, an easy problem to solve. The solution is right in front of us. Okay, let's hear the say. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we have a new topic today, um, which is the American dream. Um, and I should uh, give a couple of disclaimers right up front. Uh, so one is this is an extremely large topic, and it's, it has many, many, many subtopics branch off from it. And when we, we, we solicited questions um, on X for uh, for this, and people submitted questions in many interesting categories. Um, and so we'll, we'll get to some of it today, but, but a lot of it we won't get to. So it's just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big and sprawling topic. We're going to try to at least do an introductory discussion around it. Maybe maybe we'll do follow-ups if, there, if, there's, if there's interest. Um, uh, you know, the second thing is, like, look, like, you know, lots of people have lots of opinions <laughs> about the shape of society and, and, uh, and, and for sure that the concept of the American dream. So yeah, I was fun about it. You know, we will, we will be attempting to kind of explore our way through it. Um, you know, hopefully maybe not making that many declaratory statements today, but at least trying to kind of outline the uh, outline some of the questions and issues. Um, and then third, you know, as, as we say, when we, whenever we touch on anything political, like there, there are inevitably political dimensions to a topic like this. And our, our goal today will not be to take partisan political positions in any direction, but rather kind of as best we can to at least kind of frame, um, you know, frame, frame, you know, frame the discussions and, 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 and provide context. So, uh, so please don't infer things into what we're saying um, that, uh, that we don't explicitly say, because we're, we're going to try genuinely to represent. A, I might infer some things. A pretty broad set of views. Um, so with that, Ben, I thought maybe if it's helpful to you, um, and Ben pointed out right before we started that actually Ben and I have actually not explicitly talked about this topic. So this is uh, this is one where, where we may uh, we may be learning something about each other's uh, points of view, which after you know thirty years of, of, of uh, partnership slash uh, marriage, um, you know, will be a new experience uh, for us. So we will <laughs> we will we will see what uh, we will see what pops out. Um, so maybe I thought maybe I could start by describing kind of what I think the American dream is, um, yeah. and then you can you can respond and either agree or argue or uh, provide your own. Yeah. So I would, and I will too. I would. I think basically there's there's two parts to it. So I, th I think part one is what you might call the material part, or the sort of standard of living part, um, or the sort of um, uh, you know sort of the, the, the sort of nuts and bolts of, of, of what it means to live a, live a good productive life. Um, and, and basically I, I think that that version of the American dream I think has has hung on on a bunch of things, but like there's three big material things for sure. Um, so one is to be able to own your own home, um, right? Which is a, you know which, which is by the way you know a very old and primal concept, right? Like I yeah, it's pretty basic. Own my home. I am rooted to the land. You know I, I am not transient, right? I am. Uh, I mean originally you know citizenry was based on land ownership. Like I, I am a citizen. I own land. I am permanent. This is my my place. Um, the people around me are my people. You know, they also own land. Um, my family owns land. I can leave my land to my kids. You know, they, they will have the option to live in the same land as with their kids. That's what they, with their kids. Um, and then I yeah, that, that used to be normal. You know, my home is my castle. Um, I you know nobody can take it away from me. I I, I have protections inside it. You know, this is why you know issues in, in American jurisprudence like you know unreasonable search and seizure. You know, in America at least in theory the cops can't just like barge into your home and do whatever. They in theory, that's gone. Of course, they want like there's very explicit protections. Um, and so this this sort of very fundamental rooted kind of view of, of war on drugs. Got to kick down every door. Just in case, anybody got any drugs in there? Of home and house. Um, uh, which is, of course, you know, deeply connected to family. So that's, that's one. Um, you know, second is education. Um, you know, especially in the last hundred years, you know, the idea that my kids are going to be able to, you know, be able to have an educational experience that's superior to mine. They're going to be able to learn more, have more advanced skills, um, you know, than I had. And then, um, you know, they'll be able to then live more prosperous lives, you know, and, and, and do kind of higher levels of work. Um, and, you know, well, that was never intended, but like uh, easier work or having your own business or growing your business or, you know, you know, becoming or just quitting your business, selling it and doing something else. That's always been part of the part of the dream for sure. You know, sort of climb the economic ladder uh, on the other side of that. And, you know, that, and that's a big push. That's, that's more recent, I think. And so that's a push that was, you know, really kicked in in the early. I mean, it's been like that was kind of how this country started for much, like most people coming across they're looking for opportunity and, you know, escaping political prosecution, but also opportunity, like trying to a new land, new place, you can, no, no resources, just got to deal with hunger disease and uh native population <laughs> it's no small feat late 1900s um in, in, the, in the way that we think about education today uh but before the 1900s education was a little bit more of an aristocratic concept um a little bit more of a rarefied elite concept and it, it really got generalized out to all of american society in the early 1900s and so that's the, that's the that's yeah when they found out that they the people would be a little bit smarter to run the machines the machines are becoming more sophisticated well and they you know wanted to have a you know put some of the managerial pressure that was being put on this arist aristocratic class taken off by you know, they're better, the better workers, the workers that can handle this. So, yeah, the uh, schooling isn't quite exactly the same as the aristocratic schooling. 
it was a little different. It was meant for industrial workers. They were trying to get an industry going, and you're, they're not trying to create poets and people, lovers of the arts. No, we wanted some workers who had to run a factory, goddammit. That's the sort of ethos that we have today. Um, and then third is healthcare, and this, you know, maybe was not. This is another one where you know it's, it's important to certain sort of certainly. Healthcare's new. That's a new one. It risen dramatically, you know, even in the last you know eighty years. But you know, the idea that look like I'm going to get sick, my kids are going to get sick, my spouse is going to get sick, my parents are going to get sick, and like they're they're going to they're going to get taken care of, and there's going to be a healthcare system. Right, right. I mean, it's sick care. That's a sick care system, sir. That's not healthcare. So this misnomer. I just want to be you know be clear about this. Six. This is a sick care system, not a healthcare. Healthcare is not not adding medicine. You know, healthcare is is something's gone awry somewhere. Uh, uh, that's, that's sick care, not health care. System there that's able to bring the best of, of, of Western medicine and, and science and technology to bear. Um, and, you know, they're, they're going to get the best possible care. They're, they're going to live as long as possible. Yeah, okay, but science and technology is just a Band-Aid with side effects. My mom's a nurse. My parents are medical field stuff. So I've been around this around this a few times. Their advice is if you, if you can stay, stay out of the hospital, please do. If you can stay out, out of medical care, doctor stuff. Yeah, electrogenic, uh, itrogenic, however you pr pronounce that word, uh, diseases. Like two thirds of death, or one third of the deaths are caused by the doctor misdiagnosing. Come on, so yeah, it's bad. Possible they're gonna be as healthy. So that's not really health care. That's more sick care, pharmacology. So uh, this is where words matter. And this guy's a severe autist. So I mean, I get it. He's got to be. He's, he's he's being a little little loose with his words. But like, yeah, that's not exactly. That's kind of a new thing. This whole. Government support uh, all the technological devices and no cost be be, be damned. Uh, what it takes, or even if it's not, but maybe a little grift going on, a little, a little insurance grift going on. No, never heard of it. Okay, you know, for you know, as long as possible for how long they live. Uh, ben, I know you've thought about this a fair amount, so we'll, I'm sure we'll come, we'll come back to that. You know, kind of that topic. But you know, and, and again, the American dream, like it, it really, I feel like the American medical system, like it's distinguished by you know the amount of money that goes into care in the last year uh, of life, which is not you know the case in, in many other societies. And I think that's there's there's something in, there's something in there about about healthcare being tied to the American dream, where it's like you, you basically have the right. You... I mean, that's a boomer thing. I think it's his that's his, his generation. It's kind of a boomer thing. Uh, it, and it's really been turned up a thousand times as the as as the people have aged and gone through the system. So they think it's a right, but it's really not a right. You should expect it, although it is in the United States. It's you 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 cannot be denied healthcare in the United States. So it's turned into a right, but it's not really a right. The fact that basically the medical system will do everything. It's else. Not guaranteed by the any constitution or anything. It was an FDR thing. The amount of money that goes in here in the last year uh, of life, which is not, you know, the case in, in many other societies. And I think that's, there's, there's something in, there's something in there about, about healthcare being tied to the American dream, where it's like, you, you basically have the right, you should expect the fact that basically the medical system will do everything necessary to give you not just another 10 years of life, but another year of life, another month of life, another day of life. And that's sort of deeply embedded in the ethos. And so, so I, think I mean, now it is, it wasn't always, but it, it, it is now. <laughs> I wonder where they got that idea from. I think it's like, it's like those three. Um, so, uh, so, uh, house, uh, home, uh, uh, education, healthcare. Um, and then I think that there's, the, so that's the tangible part. And then I think there's an intangible part which you could use words like aspiration or self-actualization or self-realization or reaching one's full potential um which is basically you know sort of achieving greatness um right like uh, you know becoming more than you are um and i mean yeah okay what i think is interesting about that one is that that one is scalable um uh, it's all the way down to the level of the individual uh being able to become a better version of themselves uh, and being, being in a country and in a place and a time where they're able to do that but it's also it's that it's also your, for your family and for your kids to be able to do that and then uh Ed edmund burke had this uh, famous concept uh, called it called the little platoons which is basically like the small scale communities right small scale small scale social organizations so um i can that would require decentralization, so we have very little of that United States, very federalized. I also have an aspiration for my neighborhood. I can have an aspiration for my town. If that, unless there's a need for it, where's it going to come from? If the, if all of it's coming from the top on the federal side, then why would they need to be in doing these things? I can have an aspiration for my city. I can have an aspiration for my state. And then the, and then the full form of that is I can have an aspiration for... Or just aspiration to get into government and get, get on the grift. I mean, it's at 40% now. If it, it, it's 60%, if you consider all, all the services that the government actually pays and that wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the government so 60 percent of the gdp it's like okay that's not really sustainable sorry so the, the the best advice so far before the you know before thanksgiving for the turkey has been eat at the trough as much as possible no one's stopping you but thanksgiving's coming turkey for my country uh, and from you know and, and for america and that there's a sense of you know we we'll call it you know progress but progress beyond just material progress like moral progress uh you know progress and purpose uh you know progress and you know, like it's you know, maybe self-actualization would be the modern term but like the, the progress in becoming something great um and that i'm gonna be able to do that but also i'm, I'm gonna be part of larger efforts to do that at, at, at larger and larger levels of scale and of course I mean, only if it's incentivized right if it's not incentivized america has a long history of sort of community volunteerism one of the things that really jumps out in american history is how many volunteer associations there have been along the way 
Right, because there was no federal government doing all those things. It was either we do it or nobody gets it. It doesn't get done. So that's where the voluntary associations are a thing. And those all died out when the welfare programs came on board. And the federal government took over every single program, which was FDR. So that's been our entire life. This guy, he's, this is what he's lived under. I have, I'm sure he hasn't looked into the, the fact that we didn't have these at one point. Or maybe he does. He's glorifying the fact that he, you know it's like, we should do this now. Well, we did have that, but there's a reason why that was incentivized because there was nothing else. And now we have the federal government doing all those things, all the programs and making everything equal uh, as much as possible, which it really doesn't it at all. And uh, yeah, so he's kind of bought into that. Let's keep going. And a lot of those have been, you know, small scale, you know, and then, and then these kind of organized efforts, you know, that were much more common in the 20th century, but like Lions Club and Elks Club, you know, these sort of local efforts. And then, you know, obviously larger scale volunteer efforts, you know, religious, religious institutions that seek to have, you know, have a, you know, have a, you know, have a big charitable component to help people or, you know, other, other, other efforts to, you know, to kind of, to kind of, you know, build bigger, better things within society and make society better in the process. So, so it's called, that the sort of aspirational psychological component to it. But those all become federal programs, right? And that's just keeping the bad bureaucracy going and not really solving the problem that they originally set up to do. It's like, so, why is this, this is complicated? So let me stop there and Ben, uh, see what you think and uh, agree, disagree, or have totally different views. Um, so I agree. Uh, I think there's some uh, incompleteness that let me talk about a little bit. Um, so, uh, well, I would say interestingly on the kind of economic side, um, housing is this very ancient idea, uh, you know, <laughs> goes back and, and you know, th this is our land um, all, all the way back to, you know, the promised land and so forth, which is causing issues now. Um, but uh, kind of, I, I would say healthcare and education are a lot of function of the industrial revolution. Um, and I think that'll come into play a lot in our discussion in that uh, the industrial revolution kind of created a need for everybody to have some kind of higher level of education. There, there was some like outcome um, for being more educated because there were more things to do than just farming. Uh, and then similarly, um, you know, healthcare uh, of, a, of a higher level was all of a sudden possible. Um, and that was also an industrial revolution output. And interestingly, the industrial revolution also you mean like pharmaceuticals from the oil industry? What what healthcare system? You think you mean the Standard Oil Rockefeller healthcare system? Is that the one you're talking about? Man, boomers are really into this healthcare science technology. It's not that great, guys. It's not that great. It's bad. It's good for uh, short term stuff, but any of this long term stuff is bad, bad. And a lot of these chemical industry things that happen. Are creating the we're creating the cancers <laughs> that these companies are supposed to be helping with. Okay, caused uh, the creation of a much much larger government, um, which uh, in turn then regulated those fields and has kind of stalled out in some ways the American dream in those dimensions. So that's that, that's just kind yeah, of yeah. Okay, I, that's I'm glad he said that. Kind of a really interesting aspect that um, you know those things connected. The other thing that I think he left out is. There's, I always thought of there being a very specific cultural aspect to the American dream, and maybe this isn't the American dream, but I always thought there was this idea of God, family, work, um, which was very... Um, it's the Protestant, right? That's the Protestant, that work ethic, where you take on work for the you know, glory of Christ. That's just you, where you work because you want to make things better for everybody, and you're the, you're the person to do it. American in nature, and um, in that order, you have to, you know, first comes God, then comes family, then comes work, and that that was kind of the yeah. ethical, cultural, yeah, backbone um, that kind of the whole thing rode on. So, so th those would be the things that uh, I would add. Got it. Okay, let's 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 touch into those. So, uh, you said housing agents idea. So, so yeah, talk a little bit about the promised land. Um, it's, it's, it's more in your cultural background than mine. So, tell me about kind of what, what how you think about that, and then how much of that kind of got transplanted into the American ethos, you know, over over the centuries. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, I'm not sure. Really, like, it's, it's really interesting. So, in um, in Judaism, you know, God sort of promises uh, Israel <laughs> to the Jews. Um, they're the chosen. With the spiritual Israel, the spiritual promised land, not physical. But we'll just keep going. People and they're promised this land, uh, and in particular. You know, the kind of most famous story about it, of course, is uh, when the Jews are slaves in Egypt. And then once they can uh, free themselves, then eventually they're going to get to, you know, the promised land. They'll get allegory, allegory back Come home, on. home. Uh, and I think it's a very important kind of concept in the psyche of America, or it's translated into that, in that home and freedom are highly connected. Uh, and um, I mean, you can't be free without a house. You just on the run on the land, just be pushed around anywhere you want. What kind of freedom is that? Yeah, you're free to go anywhere, but you're not free to collect anything. Okay, that's not really. And then, you know, you could also overlay American slavery on top of that and see where, uh, you know, that's been such a kind of core contradiction in America is that. I mean, slavery was everywhere. Let's not get our, let's not get ahead of ourselves now. Slavery was practiced everywhere. 
is back just more today than it ever has been. So let's not blame it on just America. It was a institution way before America was founded. Now stop, stop. It was it's, slavery's been on every continent, every race is enslaved, either every other race, pretty much. At some point, if they're ever neighbors with each other, one of them's gonna enslave the other one. That's just how it's been. And uh, to blame America as being off that fault for that that for, for slavery is we ended slavery with the British. Okay, we ended it. So let's be real clear about that. The the whole thing about home is is, is free. Uh, you know, the, those are inseparable to me, and I think that that's very very related to the kind of original Jewish experience and kind of like getting out of Egypt. Um, and so uh, so yeah, I mean, I I think that's the big. It's really a fundamental connection um, uh, with those two concepts. So, so home, if I understand properly, so home, home is where you're free. Yeah, you are free at home, and 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 you have a right to that home. You have an this is an inalienable right, right? The original. Well, the governments are established so we can have this right protected by the governments. It's, the right is in our minds; it doesn't actually exist. But we're establishing a government to protect ourselves, and and we so we could secure this freedom of property. Okay, inalienable right was to the pursuit of property. Um, right, not the yeah. pursuit of happiness, and that just sounded a little too capitalistic. But it really is the pursuit of property. That's what they meant. But I think property is more accurate. Because property is like having your stuff that you own and you take care of, and you create something more from. You have to have that if you want a thing like in America to happen. You have to have that. You can't just make it optional, because people are self-interested. Sorry, I know it's so terrible. People really are self-interested. If you can't harness their self-interest, their greed, their willing to sacrifice to get a little bit more if you're not willing to harness that and make it a social good then you're not going to get the things that america made jesus christ me. because it's an expression of freedom like th this is going to be mine like the whole society whatever but this part is mine and i think that you know the promised land th this is what i'm on this is my right well that's part of the promise spiritual promised land that you get to keep what you've created yes yeah, now there's a little bit of a the question here would be a little bit of like how much of this is pre-modern, you know, how much of this is ancient. We've had such a problem with this aspect of not having property in the past for so long that it may as well be heaven. When we have a protected government, a government that protects that thing, it makes us a, a solemn, sacred right that can be gets inviolate by the, the dictates of the government, right? Not in reality at all, but in this, this government we've established and we're going to work for and die for, they can establish it. If we're not having to have that, Things other things happen. Stop. And how much of this is new in the form of America, uh, or how, how we kind of you know think about or rethink America over the years, over the decades? Um, so you know this land is mine because God gave it to me, and specifically they gave it to my 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 religion, my ethnicity, my people, my tribe. Like that's a that's a pre modern. I think you'd agree that's a pre modern um, worldview. Oh yeah. <laughs> right, because okay, humans are a tournament species. We're winner takes all. We're extremely competitive, especially when we get a little bit too too many of us around. We start to want to break out and go either we're going to conquer something else or be conquered and this cycle has happened millions of times you can see the monkeys the monkeys do it so we're a tournament species that means winner takes all that means all the males get killed and all the women get g-r-a-p-e-d and uh the society and the culture that was the winner that dictates what happens after that and that's how it's always been. And even just as late as World War II, the whole war, Germany splitting it into two after World War II. And like East Side goes to the Russian communists and the West Side goes full capitalist. That's what we do. This, it happens constantly. Vietnam, North Korea, same. It's like, this is how we do it. I know it's really ugly. It's extremely ugly thing that humans have. But how do we get around it? How do we get around it? We all have to have a similar moral basis, which is where the religious stuff comes in. Let's be clear. <laughs> like that's that's deep and primal. It, the uh, you know the the, the kind of um, Greece circa I guess um, you know fifteen hundred BC. You know one of the first concepts of that society was the home and the fire, uh, and so so it's a pretty old idea. Um, you know once you kind of get into like where you know the land, I, I imagine goes back. It's pre-verbal. It's our it's our nature. At the beginning of agriculture, when that concept must have emerged. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. a good point. So they were, they were basically, in prehistory, there were basically two kinds of societies. They were hunter-gatherer, they were sort of foraging, or they were roaming societies. Um, so it was sort of hunter, classic hunter-gatherer. Um, and, uh, and you know, they, they did, not, did not have a permanent attachment to any piece of land because they would be moving around in search of, you know, more food or better, better conditions or whatever. And so kind of, you know, land, land you know, like tribal land boundaries were very porous, which, which shift a lot, uh, if they even existed at all. Um, and, then there, and then there was, uh, right, agricultural societies was, no, like, we're here, we're going to stay. And, and, and then land ownership became very important because you're putting all the effort and, and resources into planting, you know, something right. that won't, you know, harvest out for another year. Right. Like, you better not have it take it. You better not move somewhere else, like, while that's happening. Yeah, I wouldn't be there when you got back. Yeah. And so that was yeah. the, the original creation of this sort of sense of rootedness. Is, is, is that and the fact that you got to be there all the time isn't actually exactly always fun. But if you have, like, you're guaranteed some kind of bonus at the end, like, you know, you get to sell your goods to whatever and eat them or whatever and trade them to other people for other stuff, then, okay, yeah, then it's a sacrifice is worth it, right? And if you don't have that, then you're not going to have a culture that has all this abundant agriculture. So it's the trade-off. You have to make one better than the other. And if you don't, well... Things go a little crazy. If you get it wrong, things end up poorly, badly, very badly. I mean, I think that matches your yeah, that's kind of where you're coming from. Absolutely. And, and kind of, you know, and, and that um, kind of went, you know, monotheism emerged after agriculture, but the, for sure, the kind of monotheistic view, and I guess actually the polytheistic view also, you know, God, um, you know, land is a God granted right, uh, you know, in, in ancient society. And I think that um, at least that. I mean, what else do we have, right? What else do we have that's been just, here we go, here we go, there you go. It's like we, we can wake up out of this consciousness. We're still kind of animal, half animal, half man. Yeah, I guess this is, we, we didn't put it here. <laughs> we just showed up here and it was here. That feeling kind of went all the way through the Declaration of Independence, you know, for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's still with us now. No, as you said, there's a contradiction at the heart of America, though, which is um, like we, we have that concept, but obviously like that concept historically, like on a timeless basis, historically, that concept was very tied to the concept of tribe or, or an ethnicity or religion. Yeah. And in fact, and most ancient people, most ancient peoples who had that point of view didn't even differentiate between, uh, you know, religion, ethnicity, uh, place, uh, peoplehood. It was all a unified idea. Yeah, yeah, because you had to. And if you didn't, if you didn't have one of those, guess what? Tournament species time. The other one that does have that. Just took your tribe over. Oh, well, you don't exist anymore. No one remembers who you are. It's like you never exist. And there's been so many civilizations like this that are just like, who are these people? We have no idea. They left no writing. We have no idea who they are. It was some random tribe somewhere and just got took over one day because they weren't strong enough. It didn't have the crazy belief system that makes them think they're going to win forever. And to do the sacrifices and have the, 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 the rituals and the... um. The laws that say, hey, you know, you do it this way, and then, you know, builds up enough strength so we can dominate the area. That's humans, man. Yeah, and look, it's a unified idea in the biggest conflict in the world right now with Israel and, and uh, Palestine, right? This is, um, this is the argument. Right, exactly. And, so, <laughs> and it's a tricky one, right? Because, you know, who was there first? Well, it's probably both. <laughs> they were probably all there first. <laughs> and what does it matter, though? It's like, here it is. The ter- here's the word term of species. Might makes right. International laws, law of the jungle, whoever can do it to the other person and get away with it, however that happens, you win. Sorry, that's just how it is. And then, yeah. I don't like it. I don't think it's the right way to do it. But that's how it happens. Unless you want to get involved, are you going to go over there and do something about it? Because I'm not. Yeah, and then, and of course, the whole thing was colonized by the British Empire uh, <laughs> and then redivided up. And, oh man, that area has been split up so many times. They'll stop before I mean, you know. The British are way out by now, but uh, right. but you know, that America. Interesting thing. See if you agree with this. So America has been traded hands so many times, and the only reason people are interested at all now over there is because it is a, you know a powerhouse around major energy sources that could be got for cheap, cheaper than in the home country. It's so bad. So what? Okay, whatever inherited that idea uh, and put it in the founding documents. But at the same time, of course, the sort of, you know, the sort of, I think the definition of America and the American dream is it's, it's not a specific ethnicity. It's not a specific religion. Um, you know, you do not have to be, you know, you do not have to be Anglo-Saxon. You do not have to be Protestant Christian. You do not have to be. Right. It's tolerant of those, but those are the ethos that if you don't maintain that the standard uh, Protestant work ethic type of ethos, then it's not going to be America like you've been. And you're not going to get the stuff out of it. You got out of it unless that's a primary thing. And a lot of these other rules, like, they just don't value it the same way. They just don't see it the same way. And that's fine. You're allowed to be here, but it doesn't become, you can't expect to become a dominant culture and expect the things that America has produced pre- previously to keep being produced. If the incentive isn't there, it doesn't get made. Right? This is not, it's not magic soil, guys.
this, you don't have to be that. You, you, become, you can become American aspirationally, and you can become an American citizen, and you can become an American landowner, and you can vote in America without any of those historical, tribal, religious, ethnic, ethnic uh, by, uh, by, buy-ins. And, and, and in fact, but they're there if you don't have the another primary one to rally around, a primary shelling point, which is the positive work. If you don't have that to rally around, it's going to go away rapidly. You are, you are expected to do so. Um, when, when you become American, you are expected to leave those other historical affiliations behind. Right, but not anymore. When he and I were growing up, that was how we saw it. But that's not how it is now. No, now it's splitting up time. And that just does not bode well for the future of, like, the magical land of America. And then you and then you become a full fledged citizen. You, you you can be a landowner. You can be a voter. You can be everything else that, that comes with this for a sort of sense of deep, deep rootedness. And so, and as you said, the, the execution on this was obviously- without the actual deep deep rootedness, or without actually going along with that. Just give me that. Give me that. Stop. Obviously not perfect, um, as shown by the fact that you know we inherited a lot of you know European aristocratic you know kind of social orders and structures and land ownership at the very beginning, and then there was obviously a long struggle for you know for kind of it's always been land ownership everywhere. Now come on, uh, you know for black freedom, and then and then ultimately um, you know being able to actually actually sort of deliver on that on the dream that was in the founding documents. Yeah, um, and, and of course there are arguments raging today as to whether we've reached that. But in any event, like we're a lot closer to that than we were 200 years ago, and we're a lot closer to that. Than- the only way we're going to deliver on it is to go back to like the, what the core of it was, and that's not going to happen until you dismantle what FDR put together, which is this whole bureaucratic state that runs everything and has patriarch networks that keep everything exactly the way it is and any change not happening which of course is extremely fragile and doomed for failure but it could go on a long time a real long time way longer than anybody thinks i think any other society has been so So we suffer we have to suffer while it goes through this it's like they're the best and we do it like we've always done it's like and all this laws regulations and people clung and different factions fight each other it's like that's not how it was made before stop so anyway yeah how do you yeah maybe talk a little yeah, bit about that. so i actually think that you know in some ways that's probably the unique part you know like so if you look at humanity as a whole like there's a lot of pieces that you could get anywhere but the thing that had been you know up to very recently <laughs> or had been very unique and kind of what was achieved here in america is that anybody and everybody could participate in the dream. Um, we often talk about this, you know, anybody can become an American, like not anybody can become Chinese, not anybody can become Swedish, not anybody can become French. Uh, and that's been a huge, powerful thing. And, and that, what that's meant is kind of, you have a first class right to the American dream. And, and look, I do think, I think you're right, you know, that yeah. it's extended uh, to everyone, including immigrants. But that doesn't mean you don't get, you have to put the same effort in. You gotta put, you don't just get it for just, Okay, I'm here. Give me all the guineas that you got for the. It's like no, you get to like work like everybody else did. You don't get away with like not working for it. Oh no, we're gonna do that part too, where you don't have to work for it. You just get the stuff. Oh, okay. Well, that's not really gonna. That's not gonna be. <laughs> that's, not, that's not how it was made, though, right? We do understand that's not how. That's not how we got here. It was that's not was it? <laughs> Including people who are descendants of slaves, um, and that's you know, kind of is remarkable just in terms of humanity, like maybe not in terms of, you know, some ideal platonic ideal of fairness. Almost like they were brought up from, like they came up, like it was a step up because they don't want to go back. The black slaves don't want to go back. So maybe it was a step up. Maybe, I don't, I'm not going to say it was maybe slavery was okay with some of it. If you don't like it, you know, there's, you can always go back. My family could go back. I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't have an easy shit. It was slavery for my grandfather in that in those Edison factories, the biscuit factory. It was not, Come on, it was slavery. And it was not equal pay for the work that was being done. Are you kidding me? Oh my goodness. So we all go through it. Every gener- every we have to earn your freedom. Sorry. And whatever you want to call it, you have to earn it. At least in America you get a chance to. But there's not this just give it to you. That's not how it works. It never works that way. Even if it worked that way, it wouldn't work that way. Even if you could just make it everyone completely even or some but baseline, it wouldn't stay that way. Because you have to, that's how you got there, not how you stay there. Like, how you, just someone hands it to you. It's like, give me, here, here's a fish, eat. Well, if you give them a fishing pole, right, the whole, that whole thing. Yes, but like, it's, America is definitely ahead on that, in my experience. And actually, interestingly, you know, I was just, uh, I'm very good friends with Quincy Jones, his son, QD3. And he grew up in Sweden. Um, and, you know, he's a world traveler and he just got back from Sweden. And I said, you know, you know what was it like and so forth? He said, that, you know, the biggest thing was when I got back to America, even with all our problems, it was like shocking how much more, equal and first class it was across race than it was in anywhere that I've been. And I think, um, yeah. I, I really agree with that. And I think, you know, it's kind of one of the, 
nastier parts about the kind of new idea that we need to redivide into our tribes and our races and, you know, announce your race at meetings, um, you know, yeah, along with your gender and that, your pronouns and everything else. So, that's, so that's, I do think that's yeah, an important, uh, I gotta say, you know, maybe, maybe the most American aspect of it. Yeah. You know, the, 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 it's going to cause so many, that stuff is going to cause so many problems that people just don't see yet. I don't know, you probably I mean, have experience if you have friends who come from other places and they yeah. move here and then they become, they go through the citizenship process. Yeah. They become yeah. Citizens yeah. yeah. Well, our, our friend Adam Newman just went through it. Yeah. 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 And they, 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 they probably have the same experience I have, which is people who come through that come out the other side, just like, I don't even know how to express it. Like, like, like they, like they've had, a, like they've had, a, they've had like an almost genuine religious experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Of, Not all of them, man. Come on now. That's, that's part of joining the American community. Well, because, you know, and I think it's because it's, that's a very boomer, a Pollyanna. Oh, aren't we just in this all together thing? I mean, I get it because we did grow up with that. That was the ethos at the time. It's definitely not now. Like, oh, I really am an American. Right. That really happened, you know, and then I'm experiencing it that way. Yeah. Yeah. You can't convert to another nationality in the same way. I don't think. I mean, and it, it is, uh, it, well, it's interesting. I mean, Singapore, that, that was also Lee Kuan Yew's dream. It was to kind of replicate that idea in Singapore. And I think they've done it like a reasonably good job, although I don't know enough about Singaporean culture to know for sure, but, uh, yeah, it's very, it's very highly controlled, top down authoritarian. No, if anybody gets out of line, there's a strict, like you're going to get smashed. So everybody knows that you can't mess around with that stuff. You're going to have lots of cultures, but there's going to be one dominant culture. So this is the rules. This is how we're doing it. That's the only way you can maintain order in that kind of culture. Come on now. Uh, but it's certainly invented in America, this concept. Yeah. Why they have caning over there for the most minor infraction. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and then related to that is your 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 your, uh, your point on the the cultural aspect, and so you, as you said, sort of God family work, and so there, there's a couple things, a couple things that we can talk about about that. So one is just like you know God family work, like there's a fair amount of Protestant work ethic like in there, so we we can talk about or maybe well, it's, Protestant. It's, I, I think uh, the let's talk about that. Yeah, the, the the whole Protestant thing is, is is I think very very central to the American dream. Um, in many right, and it's a religious thing. Sorry, it's a religious thing, and if you don't, if you're not either influenced by everyone around you, kind of having that same religious idea. It just that is a major thing, and you can't have this multicultural thing without that dominant culture fading away and becoming something. It's become something else. And well, in in how America has worked, uh, is uh, it's really sad. I mean, you know, it's very much on my mind because my. And let me make a disclaimer first. Um, I'm not responsible for my father, <laughs> so anybody wants to attack me over anything he wrote or said, uh, please refrain because I am not responsible. Uh, but uh, you know, he just wrote a book uh, on this topic and. It's a very just, just describe quickly the, the, who your father is and then what, what the book is. Yeah, so so my, so my father is a uh, I, I would just call him a, a kind of uh, political uh, pundit rabble rouser um, on the right. Uh, you know, he prior was very much on the left, um, so he's kind of crossed the political spectrum over many many years. Um, but uh, anyhow, he, he wrote a book called America Betrayed, and the basic concept of it I think is relevant because it it is kind of intersects with the whole idea of the American dream, which is um, the concept of the book is. You know, it starts with Martin Luther, uh, of course, you know, the kind of the great Protestant. Um, and, you know, he argues that Martin Luther, what he rebelled against was the Catholic Church had, you know, the leaders of the Catholic Church had put themselves above God. Um, so, you know, it was no longer, you know, God, family or, or you know, God, God, uh, family work. It was, you know, church, God, family, you know, et cetera. And, you know, one of the most stark ways they did this was this thing called the indulgences. And for those of you who don't know what that, that was, it was this very interesting tax where you could break the laws of God as long as you paid the church a fee. So, you know, almost like the Talmud, <laughs> you could have sex with prostitutes or, um, steal, or, or we, you know, just do like get drunk, all, all these yeah. kinds of things. And you just pay the church and it was all fine. Um, so, you know, he thought that was horrible because, you know, here, these guys are, you know, man should not be above God. Uh, this kind of Lutheran ethic, um, kind of was part of the creation of America in that, you know, we say, you know, we hold these rights, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. What does that mean? Well, it means they came from God, right? Like it, it, these are not our rules. <laughs> these are not man's rules. These are God's rules. And so when we say we're a nation of laws and we have rule of law, what we mean is like there are certain rights and certain things um, that are above man and that apply to everybody and everybody has this right and it's given by God and all men are created equal and all this kind of thing. Um, but only if it's protected by that government, right? It's not protected by God. It's, 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 it's protected by the government. The government observes or recognizes this is one of the god this is one of the god's admissions that we have decided to restrain and 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 say hey government you're going to protect this right with this thing that we've arbitrarily decided where it came from god or wherever that we said hey this came from someplace else and it's above you you can't you're gonna you're gonna say this is above you right that's the whole idea not that 
God actually said it, but the government doesn't matter who said it. That the government that we're putting together and agreeing to says yes, that's the thing. And uh, the way it's said is really important because people think this comes from God or the document. No, it's us free men deciding amongst ourselves, enshrining it in a written document that says, "Hey, we all agree on this, right?" Correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, and so that I think is a huge part of the American dream is that I, when I'm in America, I have my God-given rights. Like that's a very American concept. Government protected God-given rights, right? We don't really care where they come from. It's just the, that the government will protect these things, right? And there's certain things we've discovered through time and memorial, all the battles of all, all the things and going through Europe, there were certain things that seemed to be really critical and key. We wanted to enshrine them in a document that said, we're going to protect these, right? So we can have a good country that like everything America came afterwards, lucky or not, kind of came from that stuff. Uh, and I think it's, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, at least like you and I worry is eroding now, but that's definitely a Protestant idea that no man is above God, uh, no man is above the law, I think in our context. <laughs> right. And then, uh, you know, that famously, we, we should describe also, the, so then there's, there's this idea of the Protestant work ethic. Um, and this was sort of the, the Max Weber, the sort of, one of the early sociologists uh, basically articulated this. And he basically said, there's, there's something, there's something in Protestantism that basically leads to, you know, I mean, let's, let's stereotype it. It leads to like an extreme deferral of gratification. Um, it leads to an extreme, you know, very, what they call, I think it's what we call very high time preference. It leads to like yeah. an enormous focus on, on investing and saving. And yeah, I mean, how are we going to create something that's worth something? We don't, first of all, we have to protect it. And then, yeah, we'll work for it for everybody else. Who else is it for? Producing and working hard today for an economic payoff that may come, you know, years or decades in the future. Yeah, or, or for sure. We're not just like, G give me that. No, like, give it to me. I deserve it because I because because I'm so special or amazing. Or I, I owe it. You you owe it to me. No, we want to earn it, but we want to be protected as well. We'll earn it. We'll make enough so we make somebody else's life easy. But make sure you protect it for me. That's all we're asking. Why is that such a hard thing? Is that just give me what I want? And I'm. I'm on top and you're on the bottom and that's all there is to it. It's like, oh, that's not, well, that's not going to work and make America, is it? Where's the incentive to actually sacrifice for someone else? Ding dong. Even if it's some religious thing, for it doesn't matter. It's like what created the thing that makes us, makes all this working. This is, why is this a mystery? I don't know. Actually, you, you, you may never experience it. Maybe your children or grandchildren that experience it. Um, and so and there, there, and there's a version of it that's like, you know, extreme and like self-denying, um, you know, where like you, as you get kind of closer to like outright Calvinism, um, you know, where just, you know, you, you're just like, nobody's supposed to have any fun and everybody's supposed to work all the time. Well, there's not that. That's, that's going way too far. We just want enough incentive. It's like, it's better that you try and sacrifice for someone else so you can have a little bit for yourself. In the meantime, you're helping out somebody else. Then not do that. It's better to than not. Um, but there's also just this general idea of like, you know, it's sort of also like, you know, self-improvement, you know, self-betterment. Um, you know, I'm going to just you know, pour enormous amounts of effort into becoming a better version of myself. To, you know, and then by the way, to, to, you know, gather material resources for myself and my family and my community. And that, that got, I, I just, I bring that up. Yeah. And you keep doing that and you have extra eventually. And you have so much extra that you can actually go help somebody else out. I mean, if you're not doing that stuff, if you're not have that mindset then everybody, and everybody in your community has the same mindset, just give me what, give me what you got because you got it and I don't. That's not gonna. That's not gonna work. You're not gonna get America, because as you said, sort of God family work, like the, the you know the word work in there, like that. That's not. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's not an accident. <laughs> yeah, like that's not what I just described is not the norm for in terms of historical societies, like that. Right. That that in the right, which is why America's special, the magic land, the magic dirt place. No, it's because we did this stuff, and then we made it the part of the culture. Like everyone's on board with it. It's like yeah, that's how we do it here that we understand it today is relatively new yeah um and, and, it's, and it's not the norm you know across the world today it's, it's concentrated much more in some countries than others right. and so yeah would you, would you also connect that idea to, to the to the arc that you were describing right it takes the, the 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 elite ruling class to understand that hey you can't just steal from people all the time and expect people to produce the kinds of stuff that america has produced you can't and if you try it all goes away and you can try and push all kinds of laws and make everyone equal it won't get any better it'll just get worse Robin? Um, yeah, no, definitely. I think so. And, um, you know, like a lot of it came from, because it derived from this kind of rebellion against the Catholic church, which had become, and the Catholic church had been, become kind of all the things that weren't that it, it wasn't about God. It was corrupt. It was just stealing the money from the people who were working. Um, another, wow. Another new story. 
It's the same thing over and over again. That's why our federal government, new Catholic Church, new Byzantine Cathedral, whatever the hell it is. And it's like, yeah, so we have to recognize that it's not going to help us. If you're if you're just trying to make your life better, don't look to them because they, they want to keep you in down. <laughs> Man, it's so crazy. And, you know, and then, of course, the, the family part, you, you don't really have to care about your family as long as you pay the tax. And so it, it was all those. Exactly. Like today. Wow. The similar, like, whoa, all the similarities. Wow. Things. And it's like. <laughs> Oh, Fauci. <laughs> well, you guys are, are not only like wrecking society, you know, you're wrecking the kind of fabric, the culture, what's true, what's yeah. right. And so I think with Protestantism, you kind of rebuilt all those things. And you said, no, no, no. like God's on top <laughs> and then family. And you take that seriously because God told you to. And then, right. um, you know, and then the only thing else. We believe it just because we believe it. And like, if you believe it, things, good things are happening. So who's to say that it's not the right way to do it? Because when you did it, God seemed to favor that thing and made it, more prosperous than you ever think is possible. What? I mean, it's the proof of the pudding. I don't know. Was that consequentialism? I don't know how. But I mean, even if that, that's what it is, okay, that's what it is. Everyone's fat and out, damn it. Everyone's having a good time. Like, what the hell? This is work, you know, like your control. Better than not, it's better than starving. Yes, there's going to be a people at the top that are super rich, but it's better than a bunch of people at the bottom starving and squabbling over scraps. Tributing, you're not taken. Uh, and look, I think that. And the reason I brought it up is I think it's so much the culture of the American dream, like the, 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 the right was, the, you know, this right to freedom and getting all this good stuff, but the responsibility was God family work. That's what you were asked of. And I think yeah. that, and the reason I wanted to put it in is because, you know, when you start to say, well, like what's happened to all the goodies that we're not getting anymore? Like, well, what happened to you doing your job? <laughs> and a lot of that is like the culture has moved away from that. Obviously it's moved away from yeah. religion in general. Right, right. So then let's let's contrast that. And we'll close out the section. Let's contrast that to sort of the more kind of his, the more historical tribal mentality, which dominated again most of history, and then it still is, is very common throughout the rest of the, rest of the world. Um, in which the, sort of encapsulated by the, the Bedouin expression: um, "Me against my brother, my brother, me and my brother against my cousin, me and my brother and my cousin against the world." Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and oh, yeah so that, that, that I think is consistent across tribalism, by the way. And um, yes, kin-based culture is you know that's our species, term of species culture. So it's referred to in the weirdest people in the world, which is a great book. Um, our term of species, we're term of species. So yes, the cultures are going to reflect the fact that we're a tournament species. Yes. Which we haven't talked about in a while, but uh, right. worth reading for everyone. Um, but that that is really a cultural consistency in, in, in tribalism. Right. And so it's this, it's this, it's this tribal societies, it's a series of concentric circles working their way out, uh, out from the individual to the family, to the extended family, to the tribe, and then out to, you know, the, the people and then, and, then, and then at war, you know, with, you know, either figuratively or literally uh, at war with other, other, other peoples. Um, so you, and would you, would you, would you, would you, like, would, you contra would you contrast and compare, like, how would you con con contrast and compare that traditional model of tribalism with a, with a God family work hierarchy? Well, I, I think they're, they're, they're not quite the opposite, but they couldn't be more different. And I think that, uh, you know, and let me go back to, so there's this, uh, outstanding book called The Weirdest People in the World that actually goes through and studies the differences between this um, monogamous marriage, uh, you know, God family work, Protestant ethic sort of society that grew up in the West with um, the kind of uh, general, more natural, more kind of, you know, original man, um, tribalism, kin-based culture, polygamy, uh, cousin marriage, all that kind of thing, right? Like those are the kind of two core, I think, societal constructs. Um, if I could, I, th I, th I think it's the case that a lot of people in societies like ours really have a hard time appreciating what cousin marriage means because yeah. we don't experience it. But yeah. in more traditional societies, it is the norm and it leads to a very different social organization. Right, right. You, yeah, it wasn't just cousin marriage was allowed. That, that's generally what you did. You married, married your cousin because, because of what you said, right? Like you're only trusting the family. Um, and so naturally you're going to marry your cousin. Yeah, because the property rights were not very respected. So that's why it was a major leap forward to have a government that actually protected it as if it was given from God, right? That was a major leap forward for human, for human flourishing and human mankind, and human mankind. Major leap forward. The fact that you could have your, instead of having you to marry your cousin, which caused all kinds of genetic issues, maybe not social issues, but genetic issues, right? Over time, instead of doing that, we encourage um, just property rights. You can keep your property. Instead of having the family have to keep it all, you can keep it your, yourself and you keep it in your family. And we'll we'll make sure nobody steals it. Wow, l l that's a major. Ma we take that stuff for granted, even though it's, it's kind of not really one hundred percent there, and needs needs really needs to come back. But the fact that that's you know we take that for granted, and there was major most most of history it was not. <laughs> it was totally violated all the time. Uh, and you know that that has other issues, uh, which you know, but. But the, the really interesting thing is when you have 
um, those two different cultures, the actual personal psychology of every individual turns out to be very, very different depending on whether you're in this kind of, uh, you know, God. Right. It's the person. So, so these these social things come down into the personal individual, and it depend. It makes their decisions make to do totally different things than you would if it was a different social structure. Which you can see how these things would grow organically, and how it, may, it would be. It's like a major mind shift to even like think that you could have, you know, your right to your property protected as if it was a, the word of God from our government. I mean, that's just like amazing. A uh, family work culture, or if you're in a tribal culture and, you know, in particular, um, there's not inalienable rights in tribal culture. It depends on who you are very much. If you're my brother and you murder somebody. It's where the aristocracy and kings and stuff come up. Yeah. That's fine. As long as it's not in the family. And it really is fine. Um, you know, like, you know, we can judge it however, but like for them, it's fine. Uh, you know, in, in a kind of, our society, like that's murder. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Do you kill somebody? You kill somebody like that's not okay. And so this is, uh, and I, and I think, you know, you can kind of see some of that tribalism coming back in America where people like, well, you know, it's kind of a race. Well, we see it a lot right now in the Israel Palestinian conflict where I think there's a certain set of people that say, Oh, October 7th was a horrible event and da, 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 da. And then there's another set of people say, no, no, it doesn't count because they, they weren't killing oppressed people. So they were killing oppressors. So like, that's fine. Murder is fine. Rape is fine. All that kind of thing. And that, that kind of harkens back to this, uh, kin-based culture versus, you know, Western culture idea. Right. I mean, they kind of, both sides have a point. It's all this tribal stuff. And it's like the international law is law of jungle. I'm going to split this into two parts. It's already up to 45 minutes. I'm going to continue the next half uh, tomorrow. How's that? All right. Give me a like and subscribe. Talk to you soon.